The following interview is of Lafayette Flying Corps pilot David Lewis, which was conducted by Fred Andrews on May 23, 1976 at Lewis's Florida home. Groveland, Florida, the home of David W. Lewis, formerly a member of the Lafayette Flying Corps, Escadrille Spad 79, and later a member of the 25th Aero Squadron U.S. Air Service. On this tape, Mr. Lewis recounts a number of his memories of those days in France. I don't think John's ever heard the story about you receiving this Croix de Guerre. This is your second to the palm, right? Yeah, this one with Palm. Um, well, of course I didn't deserve it. Is that thing turned on? <laughs> okay, John, here we go. I didn't deserve it, of course. There's so many people that did deserve it got shot down and killed. And the nice people got killed. I'm still here, I think, undeserving. And uh, as the uh, record shows in uh, Child Yang book, <laughs> I was in Paris, just got back uh, to the squadron uh, escorties, but no, I mean, <laughs> this, this one is, this one is, this one is, this 25th. 25th Aero Squadron after I joined the French, uh, fr from the French and joined the Americans. And Shorty Bowden was with me and he wrote it up in his book, uh, Child Yank, that I was in Paris, just got back with a hangover when they said, <laughs> Uh, you've got to report to the field, <laughs> dress up, report. And I said, what for? And they said, well, you're going to be decorated. So they sent down this uh, French uh, uh, commander and uh, General Bullard <laughs> to decorate us and decorated one American pilot who really deserved it. And I, uh, the next French pilot, now American, and uh, they gave me the aquatic care. And uh, we stood there at attention and had the whole troop lined up, all the uh, squadron mechanos, uh, while they presented these. And I was embraced by the French general. And uh, here you can see they're pinning in this in this photo. They're pinning the quad gear on me. And the in the upper one are standing at attention. Is that after you had it? Yeah, there, there it is. Yeah, yeah, it's hanging there now. Well, now, what did you receive the palm for, Duffy? Well, uh, the citation you have read the citation, mm -hmm. and it just said uh, uh, for uh, uh, flights uh, far into the enemy country and and uh, sustaining attack by four enemy planes and. Uh, Managing to get the plane back, uh, creme de la uh, full of bullet holes, managing to bring it back to the line, and uh, for doing work uh, reconnaissance and uh, strafing the lines. And it says in the, in the citation, uh, uh, somehow I managed to get back alive. Nobody knows why. Well, now, is this where you were shot down? You no, were flying a single-seater spad in this? Uh, I was flying a single-seater. Well, uh, the citation was for uh, uh, working two-seaters mostly. That's what I worked I in see. mostly. Then uh, when, uh, just before the armistice, uh, after they uh, took uh, two-seaters away from us, they were doing a reconnaissance and making aerial maps. They took those away and put us all back in, in single-seaters. I was the only one that had been flying the two seers in the squadron, as a matter of fact, the Escatrique. And they put us back in single seaters' pads. And so then I went out in the single seater, and that's when I got shot down. I was, uh, I had a new uh, 220 uh, Hispano Suiza's pad, which I liked very much because I'd been flying 180. And this 220 horse would go faster, of course, and maneuver well. I was out with a squadron with uh, some of our boys on patrol up in the Wyoming uh, sector. And uh, my motor started to uh, cough a little bit, didn't sound so good. 
and was going to turn back when four enemy planes, Siemens Schnuckert, new type, jumped me. And uh, they were shooting the hell out of me, and of course I was maneuvering and doing my acrobatics that I learned down in Poe on the Newport Airport in Transmet, which is the nicest plane I ever flew. And so I was doing those uh, spins and turns and uh, the spinning dives, <laughs> the free, the R.I. double L.E. in case you don't know how to spell it, and getting away from them and shooting at them. And one time I was shooting point blank at one coming at me. We were playing chicken and the mm. last one to turn, you know. Uh, and so we both turned. And then there was one that came under my under me and just in front of me in the in this dog fight and he was such a nice looking boy this little German he didn't have any helmet on no goggles I don't think we ever wore goggles then in spite of what I've heard you mean you were that close to him yeah I was that close and I could see he was golden yellow hair Hmm. and he was looking at me and he had no helmet early in the morning and uh, he looked so nice I couldn't pull the trigger on him Right in my sights, hmm. had both guns uh, on him, but I couldn't pull the trigger. He looked so nice and young, and he was fighting the same fight I was. So they chased me around, and I did get one. I didn't have it confirmed because uh, I didn't bother with the French uh, captain of the infantry down below that saw it go down and didn't come up. He could have confirmed it if I'd just taken his name, but I didn't, wasn't thinking about confirmation. I was no war hero to get uh, kills confirmed anyway. I was glad to get out of it. So they finally shot me down. I couldn't maneuver anymore. And uh, I came down and with my sense of direction, we had no compass, as I've told you. And that would mend it, it that meant anything. And fortunately with the sun, I was heading toward our line. And I landed between our line and just ahead of the advance uh, in a sort of an orchard, sort of a, there was a little bit of open space. And I landed there and ran up down the nose, nose of a plane, hit a fence, a wire fence. And I jumped out as best I could, a knee doubled up on me. And uh, they kept shooting at me, the remaining three. They, <clears throat> While you were, after you had crashed? Yeah, after they crashed, they kept diving down and, and strafing the, the, uh, the plane. And so I... Uh, this sort of explodes the mist. Uh, it was a gentleman's war. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. So I uh, scrambled over to the ditch on the road next to us, and uh, there I found the advancing uh, values of French uh, infantry, and they were just crawling up in the ditch to attack a little uh, country town, a village uh, just uh, north of them. And uh, <clears throat> they saw me get across without any uh, uh, ground fire, no uh, machine gun in the village. And so they started crawling up the ditch. And uh, then a couple of them went back with me after the, uh, uh, they quit strafing my plane and saw that I wasn't in it anymore, the three enemy planes. Then a couple of them went over with me uh, to the plane to look it over and uh, take the instruments off it. We were taught to take our uh, road map. <laughs> it was supposed to be fresh. The road and, map? Uh, the road map. And, and the, uh, any instruments you had, a compass. And there wasn't anything much there that you had, you know. But Duffy, let me ask you a question yeah. on that, to be more specific. Yeah. When they said to bring your instruments back, how are yeah. they fastened on the panels? I mean, how the hell are Well, they- you, you couldn't really get anything off. Uh, you, you, they told you to bring things back, but there wasn't anything much you could bring back. Uh-huh. You could bring the lousy map, but that was about all. You couldn't get anything off that amounted to anything because you couldn't. The, the compass wasn't any good anyway. <laughs> I guess you could pull that off. I think I did. At any rate, when I got back in the ditch, the uh, captain of the infantry uh, uh, saw what ship I was in and. Uh, that my knee was uh, either shot or damaged, and my eye was cut from a splinter of shell, of, not of shell, but of uh, windshield, 
Oh, yes. Yeah, which because it had been shot through the windshield. Well, this is also the flight that you uh, that you were given authorization to wear the French wound ribbon. Yeah, correct? I got a wound stripe out right. of this. Yeah, right. they gave me a wound stripe. Uh, I didn't go to a hospital, but they did, yeah, they took me and uh, gave me first aid. And uh, this nice uh, French infantry company uh, gave me a horse to <laughs> ride. He had a dispatch rider's horse there, and I was an old cavalryman. And new horses like them still do, and so they boosted me up on this horse. <laughs> I went back in style, riding the back horse. Back in style. In the World War One. Had any of your uh, your fellow pilots seen you go down? No, they didn't see me go down. I they, see. They'd gone on uh -huh. over the lines, and and uh, they didn't see me go. Oh, they would have come back to help, mm -hmm. but they didn't see me go. Good. So, so maybe you can give a few instances here briefly on that uh, book and autograph it. In fact, I've got really got two, one for me and one for my friend, George Bannister. So all right. you write what you think. Well, like say. <laughs> Whatever would be best. Naturally, write more of mine than you do his. What would you say? <laughs> no, I was just kidding you. Go ahead. You well, then, body you like you're writing. That's mine. Well, then I'll write more to yours. All right, good. Throne of a battle made of wood. Ah, Scared and good. Hey, get yeah. that. Say it, say it again. Give us the translation. Say it again. Uh, I came back from Paris after leave, French leave, to this decoration. And uh, according to Shorty Bowder in his account of me in his book, his good account, a very a verified account, I suppose, <laughs> that uh, I had. I was uh, in the, his roommate, and when I saw him, he said, uh, oh, hurry up. And I said, what for? And he said, well, you're going to be decorated on the field there already. you got to go out there. Well, and, isn't that uh, when you said, well, I've come back before. Why the hell should they decorate me for yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should have come back before. <laughs> yeah, what the hell they decorate me for now? And, and, uh, and he said, well, you got to get out there. And I said, all right. And he said, never mind your hangover. And uh, I said, well, I've got a guerre de bois. And a guerre de bois, in French, that's the word I think of first. Uh, it means a hangover in English. And guerre is a bad word. You don't use that to people very often. Because if you say, uh, ta guerre, that's very insulting. It means your animal's mouth. And so guerre de bois means you have a wooden mouth of an animal, and that's a hangover that uh -huh. feels like it too. <laughs> oh, Very good. I, okay. You know what? Yes, because you know I look up some of this stuff, of your phrases in the uh, in the French English dictionary, yeah, and of yeah. course they don't give those. No, they would give. Spring. Right. No, they so I have a spring. I have a problem. That's why I want to get some of them down. If you want to say something mean to a Frenchman, say "take and if you want to say well, literally, what does that mean? Your animal mouth. Oh, really? <laughs> Gale is the, is the, is In other the, words, the Italians say up your. They use the other end of the yeah, animal, the and the animal, French yeah. use the mouth. Ah. Uh -huh. well, you could say the in, French are more refined. In French, you could say, "Bez mon qui, kiss my eyes." Oh. Bez mon qui, or you could say it in Gaelic, Pokemon. You know the Gaelic. No. Well, I learned that in Brooklyn. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Pokeball. I don't know how to spell it. I don't either. What is it in French again? Desmond Key. Kiss my ass. Key. Yeah. Is ass. How do you spell that? C U L. C U L. Oh, like cool de sac. I see. Key de sac. Right. Bottom of the right. Wood. Right. 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 <laughs> right. Okay. I never knew it. I never thought of it, I guess. I never, I guess, thought of it saying that in French. The phone, the phone, the Pardon? Yeah. I was trying to think where else you see Q, C U L, Q de sac, you thought of right away. Yeah, did you, did your Q. French squadron, uh, I know you were humming a little uh, tune and sort of to yourself, did Escadrille 79 have a, any songs that they particularly no, liked? No, they didn't seem to have any. We had, we had some songs. <laughs> Sing it, Sean. They were dirty ones, huh?
Yeah, there were some good ones. Sing it, sing it, sing it. <laughs> I'll see if I can remember any. I'll try to remember. Yeah. I'll try now. Wait a minute. Let's, let me pick back. First, I'll finish your... Uh, I've got to finish this. All right. Inscription here. While I think about old-time songs. There was one... You want to put, put on for one old-time song? Fred likes to hear old-time songs. All right. Well, here's one old-time song, and I only remember the title of it, Le Chef de Gare, il est coquille. Le Chef de Gare, il est coquille. Well, naturally, he's coquille, which means he's uh, his wife's unfaithful because he's the, the station master, and he's away at the railroad station all day, and she's at home, and that's time to flirt. That's a good old song. <laughs> uh, over <laughs> and out. And over and out. I'll think of another one. I, I wasn't there any song about uh, Soissons Nerve? Oh, Soissons Nerve. Oh, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> I had a. I, I wanted to be sure to uh, find out how they did it. Uh, I had a French pilot friend of mine uh, with a gal we do in Paris, and I said, "Well, now show me just how the right technique." <laughs> <laughs> so he showed me the right technique. Really? Yeah, she didn't mind, of course. Actually. Was this, now, did you ever visit, uh, there was a very famous House of Ville repute oh, on yeah. Rue Bray. Rue Bray, Vendia Rue Bray. Yeah, I was there, the very high class. That's what I understood. Now, that's oh, something yeah. I don't think you'd even see anymore, is that correct? Well, I doubt it. I don't know whether you would or not. I could, I'll tell you about the horror houses in a minute. Okay, so let's guess, finish the autographing I'm here. Finish the autograph here, whatever it says. Hey. <laughs> whatever you think. David W. Lewis. Lieutenant. U.S. 25th Arrow. Yeah, I was a lieutenant. Very good. That's that's perfect. And then put down Lafayette Flying Corps, yeah. right? That's good. I like that. You print. I can read you every time. All right. So well, he prints. I can read it. I'm going to get three of them here and get them out of your way in a hurry. Just put David W. Lewis, U.S. 25th Aero Squadron. This is for George, and that's all he want. That's all he really wants. Fine. I ought to put the date in, uh, in yours too, I guess. Ah, uh, that's okay. They'll know when they're now. This one, he's gotten Shorty to sign it. Would you put your name? Yeah. Just David W. Lewis, right, right under, under your picture. Yeah. He had Reed Land to send it uh, before he died. Oh yeah. See. Well, that's good. That Isn't that nice? In there. Yeah. He was a swell guy. Yeah, I have from all reports he was. And then. What do you know which one he is? Sure, you got it right under your name. Now, over here, sign it. You know, you could draw a little arrow if you want to. How about up there? Sign it right up there, sure. Very good. A little limelight, anyway. There we are. Okay, sir. Now. Oh, business. Oh, business. Get this. Get these put away. Whether I misspelled anything. You want to turn this on? No. So <coughs> it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's you're all kind all of time. sneaky, aren't you? <laughs> Dave. This book here was one I picked up at a used bookstore in St. Petersburg, The Way of the Eagle by Major Charles Biddle, who was your oh, Biddle. who was your group commander. Oh, yes, in the, in the uh, 25th. Right. Sure. Okay. And now he was is... also left a flying corps. Right. Sure, right. he's quite a bird right. of the uh, Philadelphia Biddles. We were all millionaires or bums in the far region. Right. Um, now, would you do me a favor? Yes. I've already got... Shorty as being a member of the 25th and then Biddle's group 
So if you'd sign David W. Lewis of uh, the uh -huh. 25th Arrow Squadron. David W. Make sure I get the name right. Lewis, <laughs> 25th Arrow Squadron. Uh, what's he saying? The tool fronts? Uh -huh. All right. Uh, I'll put down the date. Okay. Joe Shirley Bowden, uh, 1918. Very good. Hold a month. Let's see. That's good. All That's right. fine. Good enough. And uh, now, what would be? I'd like John to hear, and I'd like to have it taped. And strike me if I'm wrong. How about the, the cat houses? No, no, not the cat houses. It's about the the car. What? About Biddle's car that oh. you took. Tell John well, about that. We had a. <laughs> a friend there is says it tells in uh, in child yank they shorty about and tells about it we had a friend and listed man of course uh we called him uh let's see can't think of a name shorty remembered it uh, slim as i remember it and he was an old racing driver and a great pal of ours big tall fine fella uh, and he uh would of course address the lieutenant when everybody's around or like he call it Shorty and Dave and or Louie and so uh, one time I was over in uh, Nazi uh, where I could get it was out of bounds to American troops uh, but by being French and uh, Biddle having been with the French he happened to be over there I didn't know it was his car but I saw this nice Cadillac and we somebody left us there and didn't take us home in the camion back to uh, Tool, to the airdrome, to the 25th, and so we were stuck there. Uh, Shorty and, and uh, Slim and I would come over, but somebody pinched uh, our uh, truck or whatever we came over in and wasn't there anymore, so we saw this nice Cadillac, and Slim said he could jump the uh, wires and if we didn't, couldn't find a key, so he jumped the wires and we got in it. And away we went. When we got back to the field, and uh, Shorty didn't want to go uh, with us, but I said to Slim, let's go to Paris way and, and take a ride in this thing. It's such a nice car. And so we we headed down Paris way. And we went and went, and I drove it some of the time, and, and he drove it, and we saw sights. And uh, which we haven't time to report here right now. <laughs> and, and Shorty says that finally we ran out of gas, ran out of money, and according to Shorty's account, we sold the damn car <laughs> to a French to, farmer to a French farmer to get money enough to buy some gas to get home. Well, uh, I'm not sure of the details, but if Shorty says so, he's more voracious and better historian than I am. There's only one real good oratory to that. Fred Andrews, and he wasn't there. So we, we can't very well get his report, although he should have been there because he remembers things factually. And so we got back to the squadron, and there was hell to pay, but nobody knew who stole the colonel's car. It was just gone. That was all. Let's see, he was a major then, wasn't he? Major Biddle. Right, he retired, or was discharged the colonel. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was done, colonel. Yeah, he was a nice guy from every oh, it's all reports guy. I heard. Oh, yes. You know, some of the millionaires were the finest guys in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Although they, they might have turned out later in life, in civilian life, some of them are not so pleasant to meet. But in the war, they're fine, they shine. Uh, they have Ever. nerve and verve and I have another one. Uh, they have good manners. Now, strangely uh, enough, uh, Dave, he has this... One. Here comes Fred. Here comes, come on, Fred. Come in. Here comes Fred. This we is, read you. This is a reprint of that same book. Oh, Fighting Airmen. They changed it yeah. the Way of the Eagle by Charles Biddle. I oh, yeah. Show, he shows his place. Well, I haven't seen it. Well, he says so. It's a good book. It's very good. It's more. It's written in a in a in a diary form, basically. Oh, I, I think see, what yeah. he's done is deleted uh, personal things yeah. about the family, and then left the sure. rest of it. But it's very good. Oh, he was a small guy. Oh, here's some of the Frenchmen here. Oh yes. Sure enough. Chadwick. Oliver Chadwick. He was killed. Yeah. yeah was. Did you know him? No, I don't. I think him. Biddle was. He came up before you anyway. Yeah. I think a yeah, little he, bit. Yeah. You know. Tell me something. Uh, tell us about what you know. You, I, who I know, you did train with. 
was Bill Wellman. Tell us oh, a little wow, bit about Bill Wellman. Yeah. Oh, was he a cookie? Uh, he was wonderful, Wild Bill. He uh, he was in training with us all at Avoy, France, on the Blurrios. And uh, as you know, the Blurrios started on a roller uh, with a clipped wings and just rolled it across the ground. Nobody ever went in the plane with you. You learned solo. To, all your whole training was solo flying. They couldn't afford a monitor because he might get killed, and they had very few of them. So we were, we were all solo trained there. You, you roll the uh, Larry around until you could roll it the straight line and not turn it sideways over. And then they uh, had the wings a little less clipped, and you could uh, you could take it up, uh, up and and land it just to go a short way and land it. It didn't have. Uh, wings enough to go far. Uh, it had a 45 horsepower motor in it. Same old plane that flew the channel first time, Blario. And uh, then eventually, when you could uh, fly the thing enough, they gave you a tour de piste, a turn around the field, that means. And you could fly it around the field, and then you could, uh, you had to fly it over the trees. <laughs> And I very nearly didn't make the trees because I was thinking the instruction said to left rudder and left uh, uh, stick a little bit to make a turn, and I gave it too much. I just did make it over the trees and then hopped up in the air again, luckily. And so I made a sensational flight, which they wrote up in the Lafayette Flying Corps book by all the Nordoff and old pals. What was it? What was it? Gene Bullard misunderstood? Oh, yeah, Miss, uh, Gene, Gene Bullard. Uh, the one black man we had in the Lafayette Flying Car, he uh, he didn't quite understand the directions uh, they're given him, and uh, so he got up in the air and he was uh, flying around the field, and he couldn't remember whether it was PK or Coupe. Now PK means to uh, stick your nose down and and dive down PK, and Coupe means to cut to cut your motor. And he flew around and he couldn't remember which was first. PK Coupe, Coupe, PK, PK Coupe. He kept saying up there in the air to himself. And finally he came down and he, <laughs> he, he managed to make it, but he never did recall what he was supposed to do first. <laughs> he was a swell guy, this black boy, the only one we had. Brave guy, he'd been in the infantry and had been shot up, but managed to make the flying. And, uh, well, I was going to tell you about uh, <laughs> old Wild Bill Wellman. So while we're in training there in between flights and on the day when it was too windy and cloudy for those little baby planes to go up, we'd say, oh, that's fine weather. We can, we don't have to go up today. And, uh, hmm. uh, it's a fine day, bonjour, we say, no flying. And so we'd go out and play uh, Duck on a Rock. Well, I never did learn out how it's supposed to be rightly played, but at any rate, there's a runner and a, and a rock and a, and a stick or something, and you're supposed to run. Well, Bill modified the rules, so instead of throwing a stick at a runner, you throw a rock at the <laughs> runner. And boy, all his life, he's modified the rules until he got to be a famous uh, writer of uh, and director of movies in Hollywood and uh, wrote so many, uh, directed so many good movies. And uh, he, uh, one time, he saw Jack Brown, another old flyer from those half days, in New York, uh, outside the old Hippodrome. And uh, they'd been in there to show or something, and, and as they came out, uh, Bill saw Jeff, and Jeff hailed him, and, and he said, how you doing, Bill? And Bill says, fine. He said, with his roar, he roared like a bull. He says, I'm in him a fourth wife. And Jeff said, oh. He said, so and Bill looked around. He said, gee, I better not talk so loud. She's following us out. Okay. And old Bill, he I, sure was wild. I, I think that him. was at the preview of the that the famous World War One aviation film Wings. Oh, which yeah, Wings. Wings. Directed. yeah, that's that's what it was. That's yeah. really what made him. That's where it was. Right. The Wings, yeah, though. Right. That was where it was. As a matter of fact, that's what he saw. Huh? Do you recall seeing that movie yourself? 
The wings? Yeah, I recall seeing it. Yeah. Was it uh, factual or a lot of put on? Well, it was both. A little bit of both. Yeah. It was you know, one of the troubles they did with those those uh, first World War movies, they were almost all with the with the British, yeah, or Americans, but very few involved the French. Yeah, they did. The one they did make about the Lafayette escadrille, so yeah. it, it was horrible. I mean, it yeah. was. In fact, it was one of his movies. Yeah, he ruined, yeah absolutely yeah. ruined it. <laughs> it's too bad. But he was getting he, a little. Yeah, there's Bill Wellman, uh, Wellman's book there, Wild Bill. Yeah, well, they didn't have the facilities. You know, they should have shot them. Well, they should have shot them at the time when we had the yeah. planes over there, right? yeah. had yeah. the people. Right. Instead of that, they shot them over in Hollywood. weren't any good. But Wild Bill was wonderful. Oh, my. He sure was a character. But he never was. I enjoyed meeting him. But well, that's where he uh, he picked up the name Wild Bill over there, then, yeah, right? Yeah, picked up over there, Wild Bill. I think I mean, it followed him all through his life oh, because sure, he was sort of a did, maverick. Yeah, sure. I picked up the name of Bowie because they used the last names in the 25th Air Squadron. Uh -huh. so, what they corrupted your last name? Because Shorty Bowdrin, he was short. They yeah. called him Shorty. Right. Then he was younger than I could even so He was a child yank. Was a board the first place you? Uh, Flying lessons? Levor, yes. Abor. 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 Yeah. And uh, what was the other place that was famous for uh, well, uh, World War One training? Well, we went down at Poe and trained for acrobacy, down Poe next to the Pyrenees. Mm -hmm. That's where we trained for acrobacy. Well, they uh, they had, uh, the Americans had fields there, you know. But there were two, there was another big French field, though, and I can't think of the name of it offhand myself. The not well, that wasn't training, no. No. The Bourget, we landed there. No, I, I used to land there. There, there was two early ones, uh, Avoir, and then there was another one. Oh, uh, you know, see, was well, that? Place de Belleville was where we were was assigned before we went to the front. Before you went to the front. Place de Belleville. O is for combat or acrobatics. Yeah, we, we trained, we there, kept there, training John's there. right, there is another one. I can't think of the name of myself. What stages of training did you go through? Well, we, we went through at Avoir. We uh, trained completely on the uh, Blario. Basic flying. Yeah, and the Blario had a 45 horsepower motor, as I guess I told you. Sure. And uh, we had clipped wings uh, then for the first class, and then ruler when you rolled it. <laughs> and uh, then uh, with clipped wings, you could fly it off the ground and land it. And then uh, we went from there. We uh, were combat pilots, so we didn't. Uh, just barely yeah. learning to fly. Yeah. You put your in combat. Yeah. You had to. You had to. Then we had to uh, go down to Po, uh, down near the Pyrenees, mm -hmm. the Po field, and there we uh, learned co combat and, and acrobacy. And there we had to uh, do the free and the Yamaha turn and uh, Robert Small. Mm -hmm. All of those I only know them in, in French, really. <laughs> Like yeah, Ron Bearspawn, that's it. Oh, yeah. What do you call that? Climbing uh, turn or something or other. Immelman. Uh, Immelman, yeah, Immelman. Yeah, they had German names for it. Duffy, <laughs> this is uh, one of uh, Wellman's books that he wrote. And the first word, Go Get Him. Oh, yeah. This is a, an autobiography, but this is about his wartime experiences. Oh, yeah. I wonder, on this page, could you write a little bit about what you knew about Wellman and, at, at Avoir? All right. And you know, maybe refer to yeah. him. His nickname is how he got the name Wild Bill. Nothing right. long, but right. just say, sure. you know, I knew and yeah. so forth. Well, uh, I better continue to tell the story about the French cat house. Is that night? You want to hear about the Why cat house? Why don't you do that first? Let me go out and stretch my All back. Right, we'll cut and this off then. I'll be in, uh, last year, 75, as I remember. Didn't he? Uh, right. Bill died in 75, didn't he? Let's see. Yeah, 75 is right. Don't you want a cold drink? Right. The way I look at it, you have, yes, sir. <laughs> You're better at it than I am. I and on this one, Duffy, could you just, uh, I've stuck, in fact, I stuck a, a letter of yours in there about Bill's death. Could you just wrote, write that uh, I took training with... Uh, Bill Wellman at Avoir. Oh, yeah. What else? Let us talk about the cat house. 
on the can. <laughs> Probably. Well, surely all of this information is second hand, right? Oh, yeah, it's not first hand. <laughs> Why, well, yes, I, I, they told me about these places of ill repute in Paris. Of course, they were considered good repute at the time. <laughs> and I'll tell you, what, it was. It was a, it was a feast, before of the famished people. It was terrible, really. You see, uh, France lost one million men in that fool war that they fought. It's all wars are fool wars. Nobody wins, and uh, <clears throat> except the ammunition makers, and so the politicians and the, the head men. So the poor nice guys get killed. Well, this one didn't. He wasn't nice enough. But to tell about the poverty in France, and the, the uh, young men were all killed off. There was nothing left but the old men and children. And uh, so the women were in uh, bad shape for attention and uh, for someone to tell them they were pretty and lovable and they were saddened. Men had gone and got themselves killed. And so they were all over. Beautiful widows uh, who uh, had no consolation. We tried to console them as best we could. Some of us didn't have French. Luckily, I learned my French from them and from the farm agent. And I could get around quite well. And so uh, most of this, of course, is second handed, as John tells me. Hmm. Uh, it's all, he said, suggested that I say it's all second handed, but some of it might be first hand information. At any rate, uh, Fred just asked me if I went to the fancy uh, bordello, uh, the uh, Fanti uh, Rue Bray, 21 uh, Rue Bray in Paris, which had uh, glass chandeliers and nice music and very high class. Yes, I went there. Most of these sightseeing, it was because uh, it was it was uh, such a fancy place. Duffy, you're gonna make me laugh when you say mostly sightseeing. <laughs> yeah, Fred is laughing at that sightseeing. <laughs> oh, I can tell you so many things. Oh, Duffy, I think I was I think I was born too late. I should have been there with you. You should have been with me. You, you two of you fly boys should have been cruising with me around there. <laughs> you would have had a time. I could take you to places that were unbelievable. I could take you to Lily's Bar. Now, if you've never been to Lily's Bar, you probably never go. It's probably not there anymore. But Lily's Bar was all lesbians in there. All the girls were lesbians. And the most beautiful girls you ever saw in your life. And if they did any uh, uh, on the side whoring, why, it was just to make a little money because they were their life was devoted to other women. And uh, we went there just to see them, of course, because we couldn't, we couldn't do them any good, actually. <laughs> but uh, along that experience, uh, we met a, a girl up in Montmartre, up on the hill, uh, the Mount of the Martyr, if you translate it uh, exactly. And uh, this girl uh, was a very charming girl, pretty. And she was sitting down talking with us. Uh, and she said, oh, and I met the most charming person. And uh, oh, so uh, so good looking and so well dressed and so charming. And then she said she used the word il, il est. Uh, he is. And instead of, uh, she should have said il est, he is. But she said L A. She is. And right away, we said, well, are you? And she said, well, yes, I'm a lesbian. <laughs> oh. She said, I only do this other thing uh, occasionally to try to make some money so I can eat. <laughs> but she said, of course, I'm a lesbian. She's a beautiful girl, too. Well, then, talking about eating. So here was my old friend Tom Hamilton from Nyack, New York, who used to be in the American Ambulance with me. And uh, he was the only uh, Yale man in the Harvard section that he was our commanding officer, took us out to the front of the Bose Mountains back in <clears throat> 19, when was it, 19? 14. 14. 
and uh, Tom, uh, great big, uh, six feet five and a half inches, the hulk of a man, and he uh, eventually, well, let's see, this is when he was in the ambulance. We were up near the Place Vendôme, and we were in some little old drafty cold hotel, and uh, Tom was in a in one of those short beds where it was hard for him to get his feet in or let his knees push somebody out. But somehow he managed to get, that was right after uh, the Germans had invaded Belgium and pushed them all out. And there were the little Belgian refugees were there and there were two little cute little girls in bed with Tom. And he was there doing nothing but snoring and we got him a sandwich or something to drink. And so I said, well, what good does this big uh, fella do for you in bed, little girls? Can't keep up there for two hours. And they said, oh, uh, he keeps us so warm, you know. And it was damn cold there. Kind of pathetic. Yeah. yeah. And then they were climbing on him just to keep warm. He didn't do it. <laughs> didn't do anything for him otherwise. He, uh, didn't he become an officer in the tank, British oh, tank? Oh, yeah, guard? he did. Yeah. Oh, he was. He was quite a bird. Did so he die down here? He died right down here in Englewood. Yeah. He came down uh, after he retired from uh, Wall Street. Uh, he got a job in Wall Street eventually. And he uh, retired and came down here to Englewood and went to a board with uh, Doris's mother hmm? down on Elm Street. Uh, quite a bird, old Tom. Oh, he was a bird. So he... Uh, hmm. uh, he, uh, he retired of uh, ambulance corps, as I did. We should have stayed in it. That's the best thing in the world. You're doing good there. So he decided to join the British Army. And so he went in London to a recruiting office, and they said, where were you born? And he says, Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> he was born up in Bayak, New York. <laughs> but Scotland fitted him all right. His family originally uh, Scotch, English. So he got into the British tank car. He eventually got to be a, a second left, lieutenant. And he would have been a first and got the other pip uh, on his shoulder. <clears throat> but unfortunately, he kept up a correspondence with me. He and the French, and the British, and I and the French. And the illegal correspondence, but I being foreign legion knew how to do it. And we weren't supposed to give out where we were stationed. But we used the civilian post and we could write letters to each other. I wrote to my friends, <laughs> rounded friends. I'd write to him in the British Army and others that I knew and <laughs> get an answer. And so we got together and we met uh, at the railroad station and we took off to Paris. And we were gone about four days or more. AWOL, he from the British and I from uh, wherever I was, I guess I, guess I was a test pilot then with the American. Yeah. And we took off, went to Paris, and oh, we had a hell of a time. And we did, you know, because he was so big, and, and he'd say, now, wait till we see this uh, French general salute us. And he would, there'd be a little French colonel or somebody coming down the street, and old big mammoth giant Tom, he'd salute him, you know, and the French little general would look up and salute. We liked that part. Well, then, we were staying at the Paris Nice Hotel near the Folie Berger. I think I've told you said all about this. No, no, this again. is new. Well, Tom and I were staying at the Folie Berger uh, nearby hotel, the Folie nice, uh, Paris Nice, and uh, we were getting uh, air raids there, and uh, they'd blowing up the town, and they were uh, they uh, dropped a bomb around the corner, Tom was, uh, and I had a room together there, and they dropped this bomb around the corner and blew up a house. And so, uh, before they blew another one, uh, all the little girls, they were all English girls, as a matter of fact, in this troop in the Pony Bear Share, and Tom was sleeping with the, with the leading lady who uh, uh, rode the white horse, came in, she came in, Scantily attired on a white horse to finish the act, you see. Tom was thinking with her <laughs> at the time. 
and uh, along came the bomb, and uh, all the uh, little girls came running down the hall and said, oh my God, what do we do? Oh my God, where, where do we go? And Tom said, come right in this room, it's the safest place in the hotel. He said, you see, if you go up on the roof, you're going to have all those shell fragments drop on you because the anti-craft is banging away up there. If you get down on the first floor, no good. The one will land in the street and it'll blow out the first floor. He said, come right in here. So then we didn't have the whole tribe up in there. <laughs> their shirt tails. <laughs> all these little English girls. As a matter of fact, Larry Dell, one of our uh, old uh, French flyers, in the Lafayette Flying Girl, Larry Dowd married one of these girls in the uh, in the Polybergier, a nice English girl, and uh, he liked her very much. And then he had the misfortune to get himself killed, yeah. and she went over out to the war uh, to visit his folks over in this country. And uh, she uh, told me afterwards, she said, "Oh, I couldn't make the grade uh, with them." She said because. They were not my people, not my class. She said, I was just a poor girl from London town. And she said, they were very wealthy people, but entirely different uh, mm. system than mine. Mm. She was nice about it, you know, so she just went back to England. Uh, are we all through? No, no. Oh, no, I am a figure of the throttle. <laughs> well, let me see, we were, they were in their shirt tails. Well, uh, how much can you put on this? Can you put all words that you mm. didn't make any difference? Mm -hmm. that, you're, you're, just you two read just it. Two. All right. Well, so, uh, old Tom was sleeping with this uh, head lady of the course. The one that rode the white the horse. White horse. <laughs> She'd be neat. <laughs> oh, she was a neat looking uh, babe. <laughs> and uh, so, while he slept with her uh, one night, as I said, the beds were too short. Uh, for a man that size, it built for Frenchman and me. And uh, so, so he uh, had the misfortune to double up his knees and it pushed her out. And she said, you know, she's always very refined and wouldn't use bad words. And she said, oh, you No, I didn't say that. <laughs> and for that, and for that, old big Jeff got to laugh, and then he broke wind. <laughs> and that was worse yet. Oh, she said, I caught that in the near one. You can imagine that great big album on that bed. <laughs> oh, dear. We had the most music excitement in there. Well, that's how he, on that AWL, he lost his other pip and wow. didn't become a first the lieutenant. He would remain a second Duffy, lieutenant. When you got back, it seems so when I first knew you, or maybe I was reading some of Tom Hamilton's letters and that material you gave me. When you came back to the United States, did you, were you in jail for going AWOL? Well, let me see. Uh, Gotta figure out how many times you were in jail. Oh, God, let me see. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> now, this was after the war. Yeah, back in, uh, yeah, I was, let me see, I was down in uh, where the Star Spangled Banner was written. And, uh, down By Francis Scott Moore. Maryland. Baltimore. Yeah. Baltimore. Yeah, I was in, uh, uh, Fort McHenry, what a lousy fort you ever saw in your life. That was it. I was in a, uh, uh, we were in a hospital there, signed there, in uh, Fort McHenry. And uh, I went out in the kitchen. I drifted around, of course, the way I would. And there, the cockroaches over the door were festooned oh, with ropes. Geez. I've never seen that before. Did you ever see that, John? Did you, Fred? No. Never saw cockroaches that way. Well, I never liked the American Army cooking anyway. Uh, those roaches didn't enhance it any. Over in France, the, the French knew how to cook, and if they didn't, they didn't have anything to do with, you know, and they'd go out and pick stuff in the fields. And Herbs. they'd go gather snails or anything you could find, and vegetables, and and uh, things out the woods. But the Yankees, they take the most beautiful, expensive food, 
And the last thing they do would open a can of tomatoes, I don't know why, and pour that cold tomatoes over the top of everything. It was, it was lousy cooking, I'm expensive and no good. Uh, well, let me see, so... They're in the cockroaches. Yeah, the cockroaches. Oh, boy, they didn't keep things clean, you know. To suit me, French kept stuff clean and had nothing but to eat. <laughs> but it was good what they had. Okay. Well, let me see, I was, I was jailed over there, and let me see, what we do? Oh, we went AWL down to uh, Bourges one time from Havard, a bunch of us. And we got French, back. Were you in the French Foreign Legion at that time? Uh, yeah, we were. In, uh, we were a uh, Foreign Legion, uh, and uh, uh, that was. Uh, we had to join the Foreign Legion in order to become uh, student pilots in the French Air Service. So we were actually uh, uh, Air Service. We were, well, Foreign Legion was a stop to the Germans because they didn't want Americans fighting against them, you see. And Foreign Legion, you're no nationality at all. Mm. You're, you're not French. You're nobody. You're but foreign. Literally, that means the stra yeah. stranger, Legion of Strangers. Strangers, strangers that's just what it is. Right. They are all strangers. And uh, there's some Frenchmen could get in and by chance. We had a American Army deserter in it, and we had many millionaires, <laughs> as yeah. I said. We had a fellow jump ship, Porky Flynn, and uh, he jumped ship. He followed the sea. I followed the sea, he said. So he got in wrong with the French because you mustn't do this. He uh, sold equipment to a uh, to a Russian pilot. He stole some of his French flying equipment. He didn't have any money, old Porky. And uh, French don't like that. You mustn't touch or sell any uh, Army equipment, you know. So they slapped him in the jailhouse, right in the bars. I don't know whether he ever got out or not. But we used to go to see him and hand him up stuff at the bar. He used to lash a hand me a stall. He said, I'll get the hell out of this place. <laughs> that was Porky Flynn. <laughs> well, they had him in. They had us in for uh, it was eight days of jail, I think. When we got to be corporal, you could automatically. Uh, say to any private, uh, I give you eight days of jail. They could, as a corporal, you were allowed to do that, no matter what reason. Well, at any rate, we, we we were we were eligible for it because we'd gone out to the Bourges, to raise in hell without permission, four or five of us. And uh, when we got back, they wanted to know where we'd been. We hadn't answered roll call. You only could get somebody to answer for you in the roll call. And they had a hell of a time with me because of Lewis, there are no W's in the French language. And it had to be Louis or Levis. They couldn't say it. Yeah. It's a double V. They call it a W is double V. Double V, right. Double V, double V. <laughs> they couldn't say it. So somebody could shout for me, all right. This time, nobody shouted. So we had a, a stool pigeon guy, a, a Yankee who'd been a... Derude? Derude, yeah. Yeah, I read about him. Yeah, that Derude, the stool pigeon. Yeah. He'd been a waiter in some French uh, American restaurant in Paris. So he spoke French and uh, Yankee. And so he uh, said uh, to us, uh, the captain, uh, let's say, the, well, whoever it was, uh, not a captain who wouldn't be that high, somebody. Uh, had us lined up with Yankees and said, uh, who was it that was down the boys without permission? And the road started to say, uh, he tried to name us off, you see, in French. And I said, mon commandant, uh, il ne peut pas, parce qu'il n'est pas ici à l'appel. And I said, he can't tell the names of them because the road was not here at the roll call. And the road said, <laughs> he didn't have anything to say to that because he had this roll call, see? But they had us on a previous one. <laughs> and they, they gave us all eight days of, of uh, prison. But then, uh, because it was war and we were in training, uh, flying, they didn't uh, tell us to serve it. We would go on our record, but we didn't have to serve our eight days. But I got old to road on that one. 
because I was the only Yankee that could speak French. <laughs> <laughs> well, he started to tell who was there, and I said he couldn't. Do you yeah. remember how many hours of flying time you had? Well, not a hell of a when, lot. When they finished training? We didn't have so very much, you know. Uh, I had a carnet de ball. That's a, a, a carnet is a book of flying. And I kept track of all the flying time. But I don't know where the damn thing is now, of course. Uh, I can't find anything much. I didn't give it to you, did I? I no, carnet de ball. Mm -hmm. What was the last field you took training? That's what well, you let me see. Uh, I joined. I joined on the. I joined the foreign legion on the 21st day of June 1917, and I went into training uh, almost immediately. We were sent to uh, Avalon. It's right south of Paris, right? Yeah, south of Paris, and down in the middle of the state or of the uh, country, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we trained there until, oh, it took us a long time in training, until, uh... About December, wasn't it, Duffy? Well, yeah, I think it was December, June to December, I think. It took us all that time. Well, it's a slow training where you're in a plane all by yourself and no, no instructor with you, not a two-seater, you see. And some went to uh, Codron training and, and trained on two-seaters for bombers and observation and I took the uh, combat pilot single-seater training. Where were you when you flew the plane around the 13-meter uh, Newport? You flew it around some smokestack and blamed it on a French Oh, pilot. that was up in the Place de uh, uh, The Place de Belleville when we were waiting to go to the front. Right. And we sat in uh, this English woman had a boarding house where we stayed. Uh, illegally, we were supposed to stay in the barracks, and they were too cold. And I guess we stayed in the barracks and went over to her house to get brandy. I think that was it, and to hang around. And so we were over to her house drinking brandy one morning, and it was cloudy and thought we weren't going to fly. And all of a sudden, the word came over hurry up. We're going to fly. So, with some brandy in, I went out to the field and got into this nice little airport and started buzzing around the town. And I uh, buzzed the smokestack, like looping around that one, and enjoyed it, and buzzing the town. <laughs> and I came down and landed. And then they didn't blame it on a French lieutenant who was there. They thought he was the one that did it. Oh, God, I got it. That was awful. I should have spoken right up and said, No, <laughs> sir, I am the guilty party. But some damn criminal instinct in me may, may be keep quiet. Uh -huh. that, that was awful? a beautiful little airplane, though. I mean, oh, you look yeah. at pictures of it sitting still. Oh, yeah. And you just, it's just one of those airplanes that just look Oh, good. I like the Newport. Oh, Much we're... better than Spad. Right. You see, a spad, as I told you, a spad is a nice wing. So you didn't know whether you were upside down or right side up when you got in the clouds to duck the enemy. You were in the cloud, you didn't know. To, to, unless your wings slipped, you didn't know whether you, what side up you were. Because uh, no horizon indicator, you call it. Yeah. Well, we didn't even have a word for it. Which way. What was the first combat field that you went to combat. From, from training? Oh, from training? I went, up, uh, uh, I went up to, uh, uh, yeah, S3 Spat 79. Somebody was killed in that, so I took his place, you see. These were all Frenchmen? They were all French. I was the only Yankee in there. And over in the next field was Ruth Brown. He mm -hmm. was the only Yankee uh, in that French squadron on the same field with me. Didn't they call them Group de Combat? Group to come and there were how many squadrons in each well, group? There was only two of us in that group. Oh, really? In that there group? Was only two squadrons. Yeah, 79 and whatever roof ran was, I can't remember now. What kind of aircraft were they flying at that time? Why, uh, we were flying. Uh, well, we were flying Spads. So designated, if it's Escadre, Spad, Spad SPA, yeah, right. 79, or it can be N which would mean Newport. Newport. There's a whole yeah. list of abbreviations, yeah. and, and the abbreviation naturally is the plane that the, the squadron oh, flies. But was Duffy, it? wasn't your squadron the only squadron that was flying both 
single seaters and the brigades at yeah. the same time. Yeah, that was it. Because others, uh, squadrons did bombing and, and uh, <laughs> reconnaissance with two seaters, but ours uh, they gave us up with two seaters. First they gave us a bad two seater. I didn't care for that so much. Uh, wasn't good as the brigade. It wasn't going high. And it wasn't as fast as the brigade. So they gave us that, and they wanted somebody to fly a two-seater. Well, I said, oh, I'll fly it. <laughs> and so I flew the damn thing, and uh, liked it good fly. And I liked the pilot, uh, liked an observer behind him. And I had this, it's pictures in the Child Yank observer. I wish I could have found his address, because I used to correspond with him. And uh, Michel... Uh, Marcel. Uh, Thibon. Mar yeah. Marcel Thibon. Yeah, Thibon. Oh, wonderful guy. He had his left arm about shot off in the infantry, and they were using all these people uh, because the French were running short of, of, of personnel, you know, to, to fly or do anything else. So they put him in the flying as an observer, and he had a twin Lewis gun in back of me, and boy, he could use it. We, uh, I remember one time when he had uh, four or five Bosch planes dove on us from the top. Now, they never should have done that if they'd been wise. They'd have come up under our belly. Instead of that, they were diving and shooting at us from the top. And I saw, that was the first time I'd uh, been shot at in a two-seater. And I saw these uh, where you could get a chance to see stuff. And by the way, I never wore goggles. I'm damn sure I never did. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think a I lot of them didn't. Yeah, I don't think I ever wore goggles. And uh, so I could see the tracer bullets going right over the observer's head, right over our plane. And I thought, I don't know. This observer was a pretty good shot, wasn't it? He was fine. Boy, he was good and he was smart. You see, Instead of trying to, uh, he could have uh, concentrated on one of those planes coming right at him. He could have killed that plane and uh, received a citation uh, if we'd come down live with the other, the other one still shooting down. Instead of that, they were so smart that he gave his twin, Lewis, a burst on that plane and immediately switched to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, you see, and not trying to make a killing. And he... Gradually discouraged them all. They didn't dare come in any closer. Yeah. I thought those Germans were uh, pretty forceful in their attacks. Oh, yes, yes, they were forced. And they, as I told you, they, in, uh, when I was in a uh, combat single there in a dog fight, uh, they come at you. They come, come at you, you know, play chicken, see who dodged first head on, both firing. Yeah, that's, that's tough. Well, you, you've had experience. Not, with not air to air, just air to ground. Air to ground. Bombing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell them about your they shot the hell out of you. No, I was pretty agile. I kept dodging them. You did? You see, uh, one time I was flying, uh, they had the, after they took us off the two-seaters, I was flying a uh, single pad, and the two of us went out on a dawn patrol, and we're flying over the along the lines and and encourage our troops and they'd wave to us, you know, down low. And we were flying, uh, flying right over the German line, the trench, the front. Uh, there was a clump of uh, trees there, just a little clump, a few trees, and uh, in a bare plain. And my pal ahead of me, uh, his wings wavered. And I thought he was probably hit because they were shooting at us from this uh, clump of trees and they, with machine gun, anti-equipped machine gun. And so uh, I uh, saw him waver and go on. And he turned toward our lines. And so I dove on them and kept firing on them and diving on them. And I saw them. They kept firing. I don't know mm -hmm. whether I got them or not, but they quit anyway. And then I got back. Uh, this pal of mine, that was uh, uh, when we were near Compiègne, we were at a, a station. We were at a station near Compiègne in the field there, south of Compiègne. 
It's right next to a water uh, watercress marsh. Huh. I remember we used to get all the watercress we wanted to eat on the table. We love French did. Well, this poor guy, he was a great big guy. He's tall as you folks. And uh, kind of uh, filled out more than a Frenchman. He came from Normandy and evidently showed old Norman blood in him, you know. And uh, he'd been shot from the ground. A uh, couple of bullets had come up and gone right through his behind mm. and then right through his shoulders and come out. And so he stood up very nicely and reported to the captain, Captain Franck, uh, what had happened. And then uh, they brought out the stretcher and he calmly <laughs> Just laid down on it yeah. after he'd given her his yeah, report. His report. Very nonchalant the French were when they were wounded. God, I've seen them uh, just about to die, and they were very calm about it. And then you see some of these. <laughs> Doris was in a room when she was having her hysterectomy. She was in a room up in uh, Sarasota in the hospital there with a woman. Uh, about whom they could find nothing wrong with her, but she yelled and screamed all night long. <coughs> a hypochondriac. I thought of these guys, I see nothing. <laughs> without a word. She, I never have liked hypochondriacs. Well, the first field that you were at in that French squadron, where was that located? Well, that, the first one, let me see. We were on the Royal Montdidier sector, Noel Montdidier. Right. Well, Montdidier would I'm be the west and Noyon to the east. Right. And uh, we were the first field. We moved around and let me see. I remember I tried to get you to do that on maps. Yeah, it I was easy. Find them. Yeah, three you're at three different fields, I yeah. think. Isn't that right? Yeah, One of them was West Paris, the other was at Montidier, Noyon, and the other was at uh, Compiègne, or near yeah, there, which is yeah, yeah. all sort of basically the yeah, same area. They were in the same area. I think the only way you could find that out would be to write the, uh, the French Air Ministry yeah, that, and try to find out where the squadron was yeah, they would at tell that us. period of time. Yeah, they could tell us where I'd we like were. to know myself, because you know it would be fun. John and I both, if we ever get to France again, would like to visit where the sites yeah. of the fields were. Like the, what did they call the other one? The the, the devil about the oh, devil. Oh, the Pic de Diable. Oh, that field. That's the one where I told you the runway was kind of short. It was kind of on a. It was kind of a hump in the middle. It wasn't a very good field, and and uh, so we nicknamed them the nicknamed the Le Pic de Diable, the Devil's Park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you look. Uh, I've got some aerial photographs of one of the fields he was at that give the roads going out and gives the closest town. So we, oh we yeah, probably, that's right. We yeah, could probably yeah, figure yeah, out that yeah, one, yeah. but I don't know the date. Now, didn't you say that the date's supposed to be on them? That's right. The date is on it. Yes, the date is on it. You're and right. The and the height that was taken yeah. from, and the name of the squadron. Didn't you say after that squadron was? Uh, the field was bombed. You rode a bicycle to go over to see yeah, the Yeah, I went over to see a pal of mine at the other end of the field. And we were bombed at night in this field. And it blew up some holes. And, and, it was, and everything was dark, you know, after the bombing raid. So I borrowed this bike and started the, <laughs> on the road that went around the field and went over to see. You know, Ruth Rand was right next to me. But uh, this other fellow, I can't think of his name right now, he was on a, he was the only Yank in a squadron over at the uh, other, the west, the, the east end of the field. And uh, so, no, the west end, yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. At any rate, a bomb had hit over on his corner of the field and blown up a hangar and mashed down the machine. And then one had hit the road and made a big hole. Damn, if I didn't fall in that hole, <laughs> that hurt me more than the bomb. <laughs> and I finally got over to see him, and uh, oh, he was moaning and having a terrible time. And I said, "What's the matter?" He said, "All oh, those stinking bombs." He said, "I said, what they do? They didn't. You don't look so they hit you. No, hell no, it didn't hit me. Knocked out the planes. Uh, that's all right." He said, 
But you see that picture there? That's my favorite water picture. And one of the dam splinters of the bomb came in and threw the tent and ripped a hole in my picture. God. It's funny what seems important to people. Yeah, it's important. It? That picture was more important yeah. in his life. Yeah. Gee, oh boy. I think he was, I can't remember whether he's finally killed or not. Can't remember who he was? No, and I can find out eventually. Somehow, somewhere I, I can find out. When you all flew over the lines, did you get much, draw much ground fire as a rule? Oh, yeah, they got beautiful ground fire. You'd be surprised at the artillery. Now, I had, uh, I don't know for sure they were shooting at me, but one time I had uh, our own, either French or American artillery shooting at me. They were shooting at, I couldn't see any other planes, so they must have been shooting at me, but they were way wide. They weren't anywhere near me. But the Bosch would shoot so well, you know how methodical they are. And if your plane was here, first they'd bracket you with four shells, the 77s or whatever they use. And then they'd figure, well, he'll turn right or he'll turn left, and they put the shells to your right, to your left. Both? Yeah. Figuring that you wouldn't go straight. You're going to turn the one you yeah, Then, they, then they, 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 they'd, they'd figure, well, if you went straight, then they'd, start, they'd put some in front of you. Uh -huh. And uh, they'd figure, you know, how you So going. what would you do, a reversement? <laughs> well, yeah, I would... Uh, I generally try, if they were both sides and in front, but then I'd try climbing. And then, of course, they, then they'd, they'd keep shooting, you know, boy. Change your altitude. Right? Yeah, change the altitude. They'd, uh, they'd, uh, they were very accurate. They brought me down once uh, over, uh, let's see, Montdidier south of Montdidier. But I managed to come back to our lines because I say I was over the sun. <laughs> Did they knock your engine clean out? They knocked the engine clean out, yes. So I had to coast in, glide in. And, and I glided in and I found it. Luckily, I found a good landing field. What kind of plane was that? A Spad or a... That was, uh, let me see, that was a Spad, yeah. That was a Spad single-seater. Yeah. That's after what Did they Spad. recover those airplanes or did they leave them there? Well, they recovered everything and, and tried to fix them up, you know. And then, and then, uh, before the armistice, uh, Shorty and I uh, were assigned. He was pulled back from the British, not pulled back from the French, just just before the armistice, a month, month or so before. And we, we were, were waiting formation of the 25th, right? Yeah, we were waiting formation. Yeah. So we were test pilots at uh, Colombe les Belles, uh, which translated means Colombe of the beautiful women. We didn't see any beautiful women much. <laughs> But at any rate, it was a nice town, and uh, we were test pilots there with the uh, first air depot, they called it. And that's where I said I wouldn't fly a DH-4 because my roommate, a test pilot ahead of me, was killed in one and burned up. And but didn't I, you have a brigade set on fire while you were in the air? Oh, catch I had a... No, it wasn't a brigade. It was a... Uh, let me see. Salmson? Shorty told me about yeah, that. Yeah, I, I had one. Ever did, it but... caught fire in the air. It had a motor I didn't like. And uh, it's one I hadn't been flying. And I was, I was going to take it to Paris to, to, to uh, exchange it, as I remember it. Because it was like Colin Millibel. You said it had a Fiat engine in it. What? It had a Fiat? A Fiat, that's the one did. I didn't like. Yeah. yeah. Had a Fiat motor and didn't like it. I <laughs> liked all other motors except, of course, that Liberty motor. That was a clown of a motor. Is that right? You didn't like that, huh? God, no, the way they put it in that DH4, you know. They, that was... They, they put it in that flaming coffin right in the back of the pilot. And no, no, that was, that, that, that was a kill thing. Front of him. It was in front of him so he couldn't see ahead, and it made his nose heavy. That the thing yeah. uh, would land on its nose, you know, in spite of what they did. And so that's the one I wouldn't fly. No, the the gas tank was in the back of his head. Yeah. And there was a great big motor was in the front. They, you know, we Yankees didn't understand, and we were new at it. We were trying to do things in a hurry. We were putting out the the B1 now, and so 
billions of dollars. And so they took the British plane and tried to put this mammoth big Liberty yeah, motor yeah. in it. It didn't Dude. fit, you know. Yeah. Gee. Well, so this Fiat motor, I can't remember what plane it was in now, and I flew all kinds except the BH4. And so, are you running out of time? No, no. And so, uh, it caught fire in the air, just out of circling the field, to see if the thing was going to go to Paris. She caught fire. She backfired on the hood, and the old thing was flaming. So, uh, I didn't know where all the shutoffs were. There was a hell of a lot of auxiliary tanks on it. I started turning all the buttons, and shutting off the damn thing, and pulled it down, <laughs> landed and landed it, and I jumped out. Of course, they're pretty high to get out of this yeah. two-seater. I jumped out of the damn thing and sat down to watch it burn, and the stinking thing, the fire went out. <laughs> I wanted to burn up. <laughs> fire went out. <laughs> Disappointed. Oh, dear. What did what you, you do with it then? Uh, what did you do with it? Leave it? Oh, yeah, it was right next to the field, you see, where I was testing plane. Yeah. There was one I didn't like was the Samson. Uh, I never had flown it before, and I only flew it once in testing it. And because the the uh, the stabilizer, there was no stabilizer on it, and your uh, your rudder, your uh, lift, what do you call it? Uh, elevator. Elevator uh, was hung in the middle, sort of, and no stabilizer. Did you ever see a Samson? Just pictures of it. Yeah. Well, I didn't like it because you didn't know when the hell it was. you were uh, in a line of flight and a lane to fall because of nothing stabilized the thing, you see. You had to kind of guess whether you're going up or down and look at the rice. That one I didn't like well. You told me once, too, Duffy, that when you were flying, I think it was when you were trying to uh, take pictures of uh, the big Bertha gun. Oh, yeah. That you were... Uh, you got in line on one of the shells, yeah. not in line, but it, it, it actually left a vacuum. So yeah, you we got the vacuum of one of them, you know, one of the shells from this big Bertha. And we were going over to photograph it. We didn't get the best of pictures uh, in my two-seater. And another squadron got a better picture of it. <clears throat> but we did, we did get a picture. We knew where the thing was in the woods. Yeah, and we went right through the tail of uh, the wash of the uh, shell. You must have gone through the wash of a lot of shells. We were lucky. Didn't you feel any of them? God, we felt a lot of them. Of course, we had these little light planes, too, you know. Well, you went a hell of a lot faster than we did. Yeah. And uh, you see, we, when we were being shelled in the air, uh, we'd, <coughs> we'd feel the wash. You know, or if we were in where there was an attack and they were shelling back and forth, you know, God, we'd get in the wash. Luckily, they didn't hit us. <laughs> We only got the afterdraft. I never thought about it really until one day we were circling, waiting on a target yeah. to be marked. Yeah. And I saw some uh, long Tom, the rifles, 188 millimeter rifles. 188, yeah. Big ones. Yeah. Long Toms, they called them. They were in a valley. Yeah. And I just had to be looking down that valley when he started firing in sequence. And went, bam! One went, and then another one, yeah. and then another one, and then the big dust would rise up and just cover the valley from the shock of those oh, things. Yeah. And I'm, I'm circling and all of a sudden it occurred to me, we might be flying right through the goddamn arc of those Why shells. Sure you might. It just had never, I'd never thought about it. Oh until it, boy. But they did have some uh, artillery spotters. Yeah. Uh, the shell would go through an artillery spotter, the light yeah. aircraft, you know, yeah. and they just fold it up like that and just keep yeah. spiraling down. Oh yeah. It would. Crunching. Gee. Of course. Yeah, the poor old butter. Did the... Uh, I was going to ask you. Oh, I know what I was going to ask you. Did you know Ted Parsons over there at all? Uh, or did you... Why, well, yeah, I... I uh, know him briefly was all. Uh -huh. I didn't know him well. I knew him up here when he lived up in Osprey. Osprey, There's right. There's a picture up there. Just, yeah, that's an interesting picture, John. Did you get the talk to him? Yeah, he's yeah, on it or not. This was taken. Well, Duffy, you give tell John the story on that. Who they are? You see, they they had a reunion of us all Lafayette flyers up in uh, New York or right. Washington or someplace, and we couldn't go. Now all four of us had moved to Florida and 
that retired down here, you see, and uh, they're all dead, but uh, but me. This is a Jeff, Parsons, Jasper Jeff, Brown, Jasper Brown, Ruth Rand, Ruth Rand, and Ted, Ted Parsons, Parsons and Duffy Lewis. And you see, uh, he's talking to them. Yeah, to, who's to he talking to? Union, to the union up in New York. Oh, I see. And the Lafayette boys. And we're listening in on it to hear what he says. Yeah. It's too bad yeah. all you guys couldn't have gone to it. Uh, oh, yeah. Pancho Villa? I was down. Yeah, they were supposed to chase Pancho Villa. But how did, actually, how did you was, get involved in that? Well, uh, there was a friend of mine uh, enlisted in the, in the, uh, in the uh, New York militia. And we were assigned to the uh, uh, the headquarters troop in New York City, and we'd never been in an uh, army before. Squadron A. Well, that was later. Oh, that was yeah, later. Yeah, I was assigned to the headquarters troop as a as a uh, quartermaster sergeant. Not uh, no, wait a minute, sergeant quartermaster corps. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Sergeant quartermaster corps. Oh, I was a fine rank. You see, I had a sergeant thing on my arm, and uh, we carried a big 45 gun. God knows what for. No reason at all. We used to shoot at rabbits with it. <laughs> and uh, down in Texas, when we got to Texas, well, we were stationed with General Jack O'Ryan in the uh, municipal building in New York City in Manhattan. And uh, I thought sometime that I might want to fly. I was always afraid of height on a stepladder or any place. So I went up the top of the municipal building and walked around the parapet, scared the hell out of me, and looked down at, at Chambers Street down below and the, and the City Hall Park over there. And, and there's about 20 stories high or whatever it was, and it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> Didn't do me any good. I, I'm still scared I'm of heights, still scared except me too. in a, yeah, except Stepped on the plane. Airplane. When we're separated from the ground, right. we don't mind the damn right. being tied to the ground with a uh, damn stepladder exactly. or a stool or anything. I don't want to. You trust the airplane, but you don't trust the. I don't trust the stepladder, the stool, or the building. Don't trust the, the building or anything. Right. That's a fact. Uh, you know, everybody feels that way just about. I want to. But we flyers, we cut off from yeah. that fear entirely. Yeah. The higher the better. Sure. When you're down near the ground, you're going to have to hit something. <laughs> well, so we had a nice uh, racket that uh, this fellow had been over in uh, Eustace Brown, had been over in the in the ambulance call with me. That's how we got into this thing. He was a writer. And, and, uh, What'd you do? Go to the ambulance call first? Yeah, I went to the ambulance call in yeah. 19. Yeah, 14. Was a, 14, 15, and then you were coming back. Was it civilian? Yeah, as a civilian, yeah. We went over to civilian. And then we, uh, what were we, we called? Uh, American Field Service. American Field Service, yeah. They were very good out, but they still exchange students. Right. And we have some here in St. Petersburg, and, well, in uh, Sarasota, anyway. Yeah. They've had exchange students. As sponsored by the American Field Service. American Field Service was very active in World War II also. Yeah. Well, then you came back. Right. And then I came right. back. I was over there six months, from June to, uh, to December. December in the uh, field service. Then I came back so and I... 19, uh, 14, or 15, which was it? 15. 15. 1915. Must have been 15, because the war didn't start till August 14. Well, that was the, the war they started. Our, the Americans started the well, war. Well, yeah, but you were over in France before the Americans ever even thought of getting that. Yeah, we, we were with the ambulance over there. Yeah. And then... Uh, 15, when you came back here, sure. It was 1915 you were over there first. Then in 16, I was with the... Uh, down in Texas. Down in Texas. Late 16, June yeah. to right. December in Texas. What part of Texas was that? Down in Fort McAllen, down on the Rio Grande. And uh, that is the... Is that infantry or? The, that, no, I was with this uh, headquarters troop of the, uh, of the quartermaster. Yeah, I was a Supply. sergeant quartermaster corps assigned to Supply. General Jack O'Ryan's troop, you see. Right. And uh, we did all kinds of, we're supposed to uh, do paperwork and drive in a machine, a car for the general, stuff like that, you know. And, uh, 
carried this big gun for no reason at all. As I said. <laughs> How did you like being stationed down there? Huh? How did you like Texas? Oh, that the asshole of death. <laughs> Where? Tell them how you got in Troop A. That's it. That's the best oh, part. Oh, yeah. So, uh, down at Jack O'Ron, when they, uh, he was a strict prohibitionist, and uh, like Jack O'Ron, they called him. And uh, he uh, didn't want anybody to do, it, do any drinking in his headquarters, too. So, uh, we went down to uh, town to the Spick Village and call it Spicks. We call the Mexicans. They're nice people. We shouldn't call them that. We always call it anybody that wasn't. A book of Yankee was always something low down, you know. Uh, Guinea or Bayo or Bohonk. And, and uh, let's see, what are some more words? Niggers. Yeah, niggers. <laughs> and, uh, Geeks. Yeah. The groups, I mean. Oh, gee. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. And they, the Jews were yiddles and uh, all kinds of nasty names. And they called us, uh, uh, let's see, what they call us? Uh, Britishers, I forget. Or so they had some name for us, too. But it doesn't matter. At any rate, Jack Ryan was a you know, all drinking. So some stool pigeon saw us uh, boys uh, having a beer downtown in McAllen, Texas. They paid us in gold, by the way, and then they had slot machines around town who would take the gold coins. Gee. Uh, that was a nice idea. Uh, they took them. Well, we had the beers. When we got back to camp, they uh, court-martialed us, summary court martial. And uh, this nice uh, captain said, uh, I hate to take the stripes off you. And I said, that's your job. You're supposed to degrade me. And so he... Uh, finally ripped off the chevrons and I knew somebody there, a colonel, who was with Squadron A. He was on the headquarters staff and so I said to him, well they were all glad to know me because I'd been over to France and see some of the war, you know, and so they were nice to me there, and of course all except the general. And, and uh, so he said, well, uh, yeah, I can recommend you over Squadron A. He was a Squadron A person himself, you see. And a horse appealed to me and the farm boy raised. And so my brother and I, by the way, used to play polo on old farm horses. We'd get a couple of brooms and a basketball. And then we swiped the basketball with the brooms. So you'd play polo, just the two of us. Well, at any rate, I got over, I got over to Squadron A. As a buck private, that was fine. And the best job in the army outside of general. And I was a buck private over there. And the very first thing they did was to, uh, they were all trained, you see, all the rest of them. And I hadn't trained at all on a horse, the cavalry. And they issued us these great big uh, sabers from the Civil War day, you know. Same saber had the date on it, Civil War day. Those big old sabers they had to those and then you had a gun in a in a gun boot and a horse and so we uh, the command was to dismount Lunt. and so we uh, the command was to dismount and fight on foot so we dismounted and uh, got out and uh, over a hedge there a fence we were to fight an imaginary army with our rifles you see so then the command was mount, retreat, and so uh, we all got on our horses. And as I got on my horse, stop being head used to it. I tried to put the gun on a gun boat, and I had this picket saber too, you know. And uh, the damn gun didn't hit the boot. Went on the ground. Of course, the horse is trained to go with the other three farm fours, and so the damn horse shot right out. And the whole troop ran over my gun, which was very embarrassing. <laughs> I had to go back and pick up a dusty gun. <laughs> well, we had a we had a damn saber charge, and you pull this stinking uh, old Civil War saber, point it over the uh, horse's ears, and go in this wild charge. And they say charge. Well, the horses hear that, and they don't hear anything else. They run away. <laughs> they don't give a damn, you know. They love to gallop. 
toes in the room. You got this damn neighbor sticking out. I was thinking, support that thing, you fall off, and it goes through you. <laughs> yeah. But we made the charge, but the horse got tired. He stopped. God, I learned about horse there, all right. That was fine. Now, did you ever hear from the, uh, the government on that uh, letter that you finally got a reply? No, they said the damn archives burned up. Do you remember they had the letter? Oh, I could send you that letter. Oh, they did say they burned yeah, up? Yeah, they said. Oh, uh, yeah, what you would. burned up. And they were going to try to find out. They did have a fire in St. Louis, I think, yeah, is where they're located. Yeah. See, he's due the Mexican Border Service medal that's issued yeah. by the United States government. He never yeah, got it, and I tried to write that, and then they had this fire over there. Yeah, yeah if you find that, send it to me, and I'll yeah, we'll follow through on it. Check it so out. We can do. Also write to the uh, French Ministry of War and Aviation. Yeah, see if we can get that location yeah, of those location fields. Of those, you, know. you can do it better than I can. You have secretary. Yes. You don't use them, do you? Use my, I'm my own secretary. Uh, Tell you what day is it and what year is it? This is the year. Well, the moose. Song. Are we done? Huh? We still got yeah. time? Okay. Yeah. Oh, we got plenty of time. 21st of May, 1976, and we're at Duffy Lewis' is home. 23rd today. 23rd, I'm sorry. Overlooking beautiful Lemon Bay, on which there are very many white caps. Fine. We'll let Duffy sign off.